for probably a month now, God's been talking to me about this topic. Be blessed and at rest. I don't know if you know this. You're not too stressed to be blessed and at rest. Do you know that? I got to, this is a word of, what do they call that? Disclaimer. Because there are, pre, there are sermons that, man, I just love to preach. And, I, man, I got this one, and I'm going to preach out of where I'm at in Jesus. And then there are sermons where I say, Lord, I'm still working on this one. I'm still working on this one. And so God allows me to preach to myself. If you get something out of this, you go right ahead and get it. Go ahead and take it. Uh, but this is for those of us. Pastor doesn't need it. Oh, yeah, he does. Okay. Uh, who are still wondering every now and then, what am I doing not resting in God? What am I doing? That's what this sermon is about. So are you ready? Rest and it blessed. This ought to be, why is it, I guess, if you, you got to turn it on in order to move it, don't you? <laughs> I do that every time. Uh, there remains, Hebrews says, Chapter 4, verse 9, great. Chapter 3 and chapter 4, we're going to spend a lot of time in there. There remains a rest for the people of God. Amen. Praise God. How many of you are sick and tired? Sick and tired of being sick and tired? How many of you are just tired? How many of you feel like after camp, you need rest? <laughs> Terry didn't even raise her hand. This is about a trust fall. This whole sermon is about a trust fall. So thank you for the illustration. I appreciate that, Terry. You were great. <laughs> there remains a rest. The problem with resting is not with God. He says, I've provided for you a rest. In fact, his name is Jesus. We rest in him. I have provided for you rest. This message is going to be about, man, there's so much coming at you. And it's going to, I planned it to be a one week, but it's going to be a two week. How we divide that up is up to pastor. He's, he's in charge here, not me. But there remains, therefore, a rest. You can rest in God. The problem is our weakness. It's not his failure to provide rest. Did you all get that? How many of you aren't even with me yet? It's just, what's that? Oh. You, you got to learn to rest in the Lord. You got to, we've got to learn to trust 365 days a year, every moment of every day. Now, I will confess to you, I'm a lot better at that than I used to be. But I will also confess to you at this point that I'm ashamed of where I'm still at. And I guess that's a good word. I'm ashamed of where I'm still at. You know, at 65 years in the Lord, I probably should be further along in this. Resting, doing free uh, trust falls. Not free falls, but trust falls. Some days the walk of faith feels like a free fall. God! You know, God says, no, 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 do this. Hang on your toes and go, come get me, Jesus. And I don't mean take me home. I mean, I'm all yours, God. There remains, therefore, for all of the people of God... In the midst of every single thing you're facing, a spirit of rest. A sense that in Christ, you can't fail. You know, the secularists ask the question all the time. What would you attempt if you didn't think you could fail? That's good for the, sex, uh, the secularists, but how... You know, <laughs> that was a free fall. <laughs> but that's not just for the secularists. That's for us as believers. What would you do today if you knew you couldn't fail because you were being led by the Spirit of God? He would buoy you up. He would strengthen you. And he would give you every single thing you needed to be a success in his kingdom today. What would you attempt? 
that you wouldn't attempt otherwise. There remains a rest for you and for me every single day. Let me ask you a question. Very simple. How would you describe yourself? Would you describe yourself as restless? Which means unable to relax, uptight, fearful, worried, easily disturbed? Or would you describe yourself as restful, quiet, not anxious, not agitated, feeling refreshed? There are days and days and days when I feel that in the Lord. I just feel God's in charge. He's got this. By the way, hindsight is 2020. I look back over 50 years of ministry and think, wow, God, you did some great. That was, that was so God. That was so easy. That was so blessed. It's the forward look that we say, oh, God, can I do this? But he already did all of this. You understand what I'm saying? He accomplished that. And if you think you want to take the credit for that, you're wrong. Because he did those things in us. All we did was say, God, I'm yours. I'm yours. Restful, quiet, not anxious, not agitated, feeling refreshed. And daily, are we resting? Would you say that word together with me? Resting. Resting. Calm. Full of his peace. Tranquil. What a world. I, some of you are going, I don't even know how to get there. That's what this message is about. But that's what God is saying to us today is, I need you to be tranquil. tranquil. <laughs> Not on tranks. <laughs> but tranquil. Yeah, <laughs> thankful. <laughs> some of you don't need That's good. You don't even know what tranks are. That's okay. Tranquilizers, Okay. Uh, God doesn't need you to be on tranks. So we used to call it when we did a lot of counseling. Are you on tranks? You know, tranquilizers. Uh, he needs us to just be calm so that the world will look at this, us in the midst of this mess and say, how do you do that? How are you so calm? How are you so tranquil? In the midst of all that's going around you. And so are we, and, and I guess my answer, my answer to these questions is yes, yes, and yes. Yes, sometimes I'm restless. You know? Yes, most of the time I'm restful. I'm believing God is sovereign, and I'm believing that he's in charge, and I can trust him, and I can rest in him, and I don't have to, here's that word, control the situation? Or am I the only one that has a problem with control? <laughs> oh, okay, good. All right. I don't have to control the situation. I can simply say, God, you're in charge, and you know what you're doing. He is omniscient, omnipotent, and omnipresent. He is all wise. He is always there. Always there. What did I miss? All-powerful, thank you. Yeah, omnipotent, all-powerful. You look at the mess around you and you say, oh, how are we going to get delivered from this? I mean, the second part of the sermon, I got a whole list of things that we fear. And at the top of that list is pandemics, you know. God says, why are you fearing that? Why would you fear pandemics? I am the healer of every disease. My name is Jehovah Rapha, the Lord, your healer. Why do you live like the rest of the world in fear when you've got Jesus? Yeshua, which in Hebrew simply means the deliverer. The deliverer. Okay. Let's look for a minute. Are we blessed or are we blessed? blessed. Come on. How many of you believe you're blessed? Yes. This psalm that I'm about to read to you was written by David. 
David knew what peer pressure was. David knew that the army of Israel was after him. David knew that the man he served, King Saul, was trying to kill him. David's over in the corner playing worship songs on his harp, trying to quiet the king, and the king picks up his sword and throws it at David to kill him. You think you got problems? <laughs> I don't think anybody's trying to kill you except the devil. I don't think anybody's trying to kill you. But there were a bunch of people trying to kill David, and for 17 years, David wandered around in, in the caves of Israel, running from King Saul, fearing for his life. 17 years. That's a long time to run for your life. That was before he became king. And in the middle of all of that, David writes this psalm. Here it is. You ready for it? Praise the Lord, O oh my soul. Mm, that's right. Oh, come on. Praise the Lord, O oh my soul. Yes. That's your emotions. Pray, we praised God with our spirit, but we also praised him with our emotions, our will, our intellect. You know? Uh, will, intellect, and emotions. That's your soul. All right? Praise the Lord. David, I talk to myself all the time. You talk to yourself? The only time I get word is when I answer myself. Okay? But I talk to myself, and I talk to myself just like David did. What are you doing, Gordon? What is that attitude? You know that doesn't belong there. Come on. That doesn't belong there. Praise the Lord, he says. In another passage, he says, praise the Lord, O my soul. You know, why is my heart disquieted within me? Hope thou in God. As my wife's been praying over me for several days for this, she says to, says to me, give them hope. Give them hope. When you preach, give them hope. We're not preaching you under the table. Oh, you don't rest in Jesus? You're in trouble. God loves you. He longs to bring us to that place where we simply rest and trust and hope in him. He longs for us to be there. So are we blessed? Why would we praise God? David in the midst of all this says, Lord, help me not to forget your benefits. What are the bennies? And I'm not talking about drugs bennies. <laughs> okay. And what are the benefits of serving God? Are you ready for this? Here it is. David says, because Lord, you forgive all my sins. Lord, you forgive the less grievous ones and the other ones I hide real good because I don't want you to see. What? No. Lord, you forgive all my sins, A to Z, every single time, Lord, you forgive all my sins. David had a lot of sins. We won't even go there. That's not what this message is about. But let me tell you, David had a lot of sins. David would not have been allowed to stand in a pulpit today based on his character at times within his life, in some churches at least. You know, that's a, that's a mistake. Because God cleanses and forgives us and moves us on. Uh, restores, renews, reconciles us, and then reconciles us with people. But David would not have been allowed in many churches today to stand in the pulpit. Why? Because he had a lot of sins. But David says, I know where to go to get my sins forgiven. His name is Yeshua. Yeshua, Jesus who forgives all my sins, who heals the easier things that are wrong with my body. You know, he can help me get over a cold. I don't know if that's easy or not, but he can help me get over a cold. But he can't help me with some of the other problems I got. Oh, really? Oh, yes, he can. He heals all. Y'all say all with me? 
all my diseases. Let me see, does that include COVID? Ah, yes. He heals all my diseases. He redeems my life. This passage says from the pit, but I put an S there. It's referring to the eternal pit, hell. However, I build a lot of pits and dig a lot of pits along the way for myself. Have you ever done that? Oh, yeah. yeah, okay. And how about the pits other people dig for you? I don't even need help. I can dig my own pits, but I have had in my life other people who dug big pits for me and then pushed me into them and called me brother while they were doing it. You know, let me just tell you, God is the deliverer from the pits. If you think you're in the pits, boy, have I got good news for you. You can rest in Jesus because he'll get you out of the pit you're in, regardless of who was the source of that pit. He redeems our lives from the pits. He crowns us with love and compassion. Wow. I don't know about you, but when I grew up, even though I grew up in an evangelical church and I heard the gospel all my childhood, I still believed that I needed to be really afraid of God because he was really big. And I was really tiny little. And I should be afraid of him. Now, don't get me wrong, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of all wisdom. The author, author of Proverbs said that the fear of the Lord, but that's a reverential respect for who God is. That's not a shaking, tumultuous fear that comes over us. God says, I am love and I will fill your life with love. In fact, when it comes to defining in the Bible what love is, it doesn't say what love is, it says who God is or who love is. God is love. And when you go to God, you have no reason to quake and fear and shake. You have every reason to say, Jesus, you love me. And your word says that you will crown me with your love. If he loves you, he's got good thoughts for you. He's got, you know, Jeremiah 29, 11, He's got great plans for your life. Yes. Just relax and free fall or trust fall. <laughs> That's better. Crowns us with love and compassion. David said while he's running from his enemies, Lord, you crown me with love and compassion. He satisfies our desires with good things. My life is filled with good things and good people. She said, don't talk about me, so I'm not. <laughs> Satisfies my desires with good things. How many good things is your life filled with? If you say not a lot, then maybe you're not close enough to God. Because that's where the blessings run out. You want to be under the spout where the glory comes out and the blessings of God with it, right? Amen. So he satisfies our desires with wonderfully good things all the time, every day. And finally, David said, he renews our youth like the eagles. You know what eagles are. You know what they do. They may go through a tough time. They may go through the storm, but it's only to get on top of it. And they literally have two sets of eyelids. I don't mean two eyelids, I mean two different sets of eyelids. One is for going through the storm, and they close that one, and the rain stays out of it, but they can see enough opaquely that they know they're still in the storm. I've closed my eyes to the world enough to know I'm still in the storm, but I can see it. It's there. It's real, but you know what? I'm going to do what the eagle does. He climbs through the storm to ride on the tops of the clouds. He just surfs all that confusion and all that chaos. He just rides on top of it. Amen. And that's what God tells us to do. You ride 
on top of your circumstances. He made you the head and not the tail. The Bible says. We're not to ride and stay and struggle in that storm. We're to rise above it as the eagle does. And when you do, and I, you know, I guess there are folks here who are older than I am. But our best and sweetest, Cora, who used to correct me all the time, I'd say, and now that I'm old, she'd say, oh, you're just a young kid. <laughs> and she reached 100 and then went home to be with Jesus. So I'll, I'll use as the illustration June, okay? I know she's watching. Don't be mad at me. June is amazing. I talk with her every week. 101, and she looks at me and says, and I'm going to live to be 120 and enjoy every minute of it. 120. And she's got this smile that goes from here to here. And if you start to be negative, she'll just smile and walk away. Because <laughs> she says, I hate to be with negative people. I can't stand them. So if she walks away from you, look out and change your attitude. <clears throat> uh, but God renews the strength when you're 101 or June, 120. God renews your strength like the youth of the eagle. And you could soar and do things you'd have never guessed you could have done in your old age. Hang on to that. You're young, but hang on to that. I don't know why I pointed to you, but... <laughs> All right? So we are blessed in Christ. We've got another line of blessings here. I, we're, we're looking at how do you rest in Christ. Part of that is to understand you're blessed beyond measure. You have no idea how blessed you are. We come to the writings of Moses in the book of, of Deuteronomy, and in chapter 28, verses 1 through 14, he gives a listing. He says, now, now Israel, I could say the people of God, listen to this. If you'll just read my word, if you'll walk in cheerful obedience to my word and just relax and trust in me, this is what I'll do for you. Are you ready for this? I will bless you in the city. I will bless you in the country, in your fields. I don't know. We got any grape farmers here? I'll bless you in the vineyards. If you're not agriculturally minded as I'm not, some people have green thumbs, you know, my wife does. I got a black thumb. I touch it, it dies. You know? <laughs> so she says, please don't touch my flowers. <laughs> and I leave them alone, unless she's supervising. <laughs> Sometimes she allows me to then. Blessed shall you be in your field, in the country, when you're out in the country. Man, we went for a ride in the country. Jason and I and Amanda, where are you, Amanda? She's down with the kids. And we met up with uh, Zach Stalter, who was doing great in the Lord. Uh, we went down, we went down to Oleana. We rode, they rode all over the place. Nisi and I took the nitro, Dodge Nitro, and uh, followed with them. And we just had a blast. And then we walked through Rock City. And we had a greater blast. And here's these massive, far better than... Uh, Panama Rocks. If you've been to Panama Rocks, you ain't seen nothing yet. Go to Rock City and Olean. It's amazing. God did that. My God did that. Yeah. Yesterday we saw this, what was it, 30-ton rock balanced on another rock about that much touching. It's just sitting there. It's balancing. You know, my God does those things. All kinds of things that God will do for you. He'll bless you in the country. He'll bless you in the city. He'll bless you in your body. And we don't have any medical staff here, I don't think, so I can say this with impunity. I don't care what the doctor says about my body. It ain't so, because I know what God says about my body. He says, you are healed in my name. So you take all the x-rays you want, I am healed in the name of Jesus. We have living proof of that sitting right there. Thank you for being our example. That's an example of faith. 
you want to follow. That's an example of faith. I don't care what the doctor says. Every now and then the doctor says, well, you got this, you got that, and you got it. If you say so, but I say no, because God says no. <laughs> so blessed shall you be, if you just read my word, obey it, in your body, in your health. Uh, blessed shall you be in your produce. Now he's talking about cows and donkeys and camels and uh, I just turn that into the modern age by saying, in what you produce, what's your career? God will bless you in your career. If you, I don't care if it's cutting hair or uh, you know, whatever it is that you do, teaching school and working with kids, uh, managing a store, God says, I will bless you in your career if you will just trust me. Rest in me. Boy, is that tough. I will confess to you, this is the toughest ba ba battle I've probably had throughout my life, is just resting. I, some of you are looking at me like, Pastor, how can you say that? You're that old and you're, that, and you're 50 years in ministry. Because just like with you, there's a war going on inside of me. My flesh and my intellect say, oh, the life is terrible and this is not good. And boy, that's bad and that's bad. And, and over here is a mess. And boy, I don't know what's going to happen over here. But the God who lives in my spirit says, I got this. I got this. Don't sweat it. You know, that's Hezekiah 8.3, I think. Don't sweat the small stuff. Right? Okay. You shall be blessed in what you produce in your career. You shall be blessed in your reserves. That's your savings. God's got you. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills and the wealth in every mine. And every now and then I just look at him and I say, God, kill another cow or two for me, would you? Because <laughs> I need it right now. But his finances are never depleted, ever. Never have been in all the time of man, never will be, never could be. Because he owns it all, he created it all, and everything in this universe belongs to him. And when he created this world, he didn't go to the bank and say, can I take out a loan, please? <laughs> he said, I got this, and spoke the worlds into existence. Now, that's a whole different sermon, but you and I need to speak. In fact, you and I are speaking our worlds into existence. If you've got a bad world, you may want to look at what you're saying. Oh, life is terrible and things a mess and eh, this is awful and that's bad and everybody's against me. God is for you. It doesn't matter who's against you. It just doesn't matter. Y'all got that? It doesn't matter. He said, I'll be with you in your comings and I'll be with you in your goings. And we went all over yesterday and we had a great time. Fantastic time. Uh, I'll be with you in your comings and I'll be with you in your goings. I leave that one for you. You're going bys. God is going with you and his blessings are going with you. I've already laid hands on her and prayed the blessing of God over her and told her we released her through the blessings of God to do whatever God's led her to do. But in your goings, God is blessing you. Blessed shall you be even in wartime. He said, when you go to war, we're at war. Can I just tell you, this is the second part of the sermon, but i got to tell you, we're at war. There is a kingdom of darkness that's trying to destroy you. But there is a kingdom of light that upholds you. <laughs> you and I, are you ready for this? Major part of this lesson of rest you, gonna, you and I get to choose, do I walk in the fear and anxiety of the kingdom of darkness or do I get to walk in, or do I choose to walk in the light of God's kingdom where I know everything will be all right because he's in charge and I trust him because he loves me. And if I ever doubted that, I'd look at Calvary and know, now nah, he gave me his son, what else is there? 
I believe it's Romans that says, if I gave you my son, will I not also with him give you all things freely? Why would we not rest except the flesh is constantly and the enemy is constantly with the fiery darts? Well, I got news for you. He's already lost. He lost 2,000 years ago at Calvary's Hill. When Jesus said it is finished, he meant the battle that you and I are going through. He determined that battle 2,000 years ago. It's over. Do you know that? Do you live in that? I'm working on that. I'm working on it. (laughs) Even in time of war. So what's our response to the blessings of God? We are incredibly, mightily blessed by Christ. So what do we do with that? Do we rest and praise him and trust him as David did in the middle of the wars he was going through? Or do we live in fear and anxiety and doubt and mistrust? Are you living, and here's the question, same question, just phrase different. So do we live out of our flesh that says we're in big trouble? Or do we live out of our spirit? that is controlled by the Holy Spirit, where God says, I got this. I created it all. And by the way, when it comes to it, I'm going to destroy this world and all of the heavens with it that are tainted with sin, and I'm going to create a new heaven, new heavens and a new earth. And they will be without sin. They will be without pain. They will be without tears. They will be with nothing negative and only the sweet presence of God and all of the blessings of God that accrue to us for doing one thing, two things. One, receiving Jesus as our personal Lord and Savior. Two, surrendering in rest to him. Learning to do that more and more and more. So do we believe God and are we at rest in him? This is a question you've got to ask yourself a thousand times a day ought to do. (laughs) Are you in him? All right. Or do we sadly live in and speak out of the language of the kingdom of darkness, fear and anxiety, mistrust, uh, doubts? I don't know what we're going to do in the middle of this. Yeah, you do. You're going to trust God. How is this nation ever going to make it through? You know what? Some of you aren't ready for this. Every nation will fall, including America. Read the book of Daniel. God says every kingdom of man will fall, and great will be the fall thereof. And then, out of that rubble comes the stone, who becomes a rock, who becomes the mountain of God. Jesus Christ and his kingdom. You know what? We're already in that kingdom. You and I are in that kingdom. So what are we doing worrying? We're in the kingdom of God. It's a choice, folks. Today, you can choose. Today, you get to choose, and every day you get to choose, and every moment of every day you get to choose, do I relax and trust him? You know, there's, there's a, a little bit more to this. <laughs> there's a nation by the name of Israel, or in Hebrew, Yisrael, and the nation of Israel was blessed by God beyond measure, that blessing, blessed in the city, blessed in the country, that was first given to them. He said, you just obey me, trust me, rest in me, I'll take care of you. And after centuries of God blessing them, they still stood in rebellion. They still stood in rebellion. And you come to Psalm 95 and verse 10, and you know what he told them? 
You know what he warns us? He said, I hated that generation for 40 long years. He said, they grieved me. It's like a faithful husband or wife who pours out blessings constantly on their mate and gets back evil. That's what Israel did. In fact, at one point in uh, Jeremiah, he said, I divorced them. Because under every lofty tree, on every hillside, they worshipped heathen gods. And they would not come to me, and they would not love me. And God says, I divorced Israel. I gave them a bill of divorcement, is the King James Version. I gave them a bill of divorcement. Why? Because they wouldn't believe. So God said to Israel, and recorded it later in Hebrews chapter 3, verse 19, I promise you, you will never enter my rest. That's scary. God says, I promise you, you will never enter my rest. Why? Because generation after generation, when God poured out his blessings on them, they failed to thank him and they failed to rest in him and to trust him. And so he called that unbelief. In other words, their disobedience was unbelief. They didn't believe God was good. And I ask myself, and I'm going to ask you this, I ask myself regularly, Gordon, do you really believe God is good? Well, of course I do. I got several degrees in theology. Of course I believe God is good. No, 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 that's not the question. Do you believe that God is so good that he will never bring you harm? That you can trust him, that you can trust, fall into his grace. I love that. Thank you. Thanks for being our illustration for the sermon this week. (laughs) You can trust, you can literally lean into the grace of God by your tippy toes and then just fall. And God will have you every single time. And he will not fail you and he will not hurt you ever because he crowns you with love and compassion. Now is that to say there's no judgment? There's no judgment for those who rest and trust in him And those who are working, and I should say those of us who are working to get there, better every day and better every day. There's grace for every day. There is great hope. Great hope. And I don't mean a hope like I hope I make it. I mean the hope is that Jesus is our hope and we will make it. Because the work that he has started in you, he will finish. Oh, that was terrible. I got two amens. I got a head shake and I got an amen. The work he started in you, he says, he will finish. All right. So you're not going to make it? Is that judgment for me? No. Rest in him. The judgment is for those who absolutely refuse to thank him ever, praise him ever, rest in him ever. They worry forever. And they allow themselves to be filled with anxiety. Constantly. Constantly. And so that was Israel. And Israel went into 400 years of bondage because of their disobedience. God says, I'm going to send them into into time out. And he put them in the corner. 400 years worth. And then he says, no, I didn't forget the promises I made to you. You want to come out of time out? I'll take you out of Israel, or excuse me, out of Egypt. And I'll do miracles to get you out. I'll split the Red Sea. My daughter Ginger called me the other day and she says, Daddy, did you know that a group of of, uh, professional scuba divers who are, uh, I forget what their title is, but at any rate, they're professionals who do nothing but, uh, but look for what's going on in, in ancient history. Do you know they found the armor and bones of the whole Egyptian army at the bottom of the Red Sea? I said, I knew that. She said, you knew they found it? I said, I didn't know they found it. I knew they were there. I knew they were there. 
She said, but they found it. I said, well, that's cool, but I already knew it. <laughs> because I choose to believe the word of God. Amen. Those aren't sweet stories. That's reality. That's fact. But Israel, God said, you will never enter. And when I say God said they will never, you understand they died in the wilderness? Not one soul from that generation except uh, Joshua and Caleb entered into the promised land. They all died, including Moses, by the way, who had an anger problem. And smote the rock instead of speaking to the rock. Moses. I believe Moses is in heaven. You saw him on the Mount of Transfiguration. He'll be there, but it cost him dearly that he didn't simply rest. If you read the words of Moses in Numbers chapter 11, he's complaining to God. He said, did I bring this people out of Israel? Excuse me, out of Egypt? Did I bring them out, God? Why is it my job to feed them, God? They're driving me crazy, God. It's enough with me. Take me home. And you know what? God took him up on it. Later, it was a while later, 40 years God blessed the nation of Israel going through the wilderness. Should have been a 10-day march. You all know that? Moving from, from Egypt into the promised land should have been, and God planned it to be a 10-day march for three and a half million Jewish people. Instead, it was 40 years of grumbling and complaining, and when God fed them manna from heaven... They grumbled and complained and said, we remember the leeks and the garlics that we ate in Egypt. That's what they said to God. God said, keep it up. Mm -hmm. Folks, don't grumble and complain at God. He knows how to fix the mess you're in. He is the only one who knows how to fix the mess you're in. Don't grumble and complain. Praise him. The Lord say, Lord, I understand you know how to fix this, and I trust you, and I'm doing a trust fall, God, right into your grace. And I come expectantly to you just believing you're going to fix this. Why? Because you're God, and you can, and you love me, and you love me. But Israel never entered the promised land, and God said it was because of your unbelief, but the unbelief was disobedience. Because, hear me now, watch me. The Bible says in the Old Testament, they knew the word of God, but they did not walk in his ways. Folks, much of the church knows the word, but we struggle to walk in his ways. Have you got that? They lost the blessing not because they weren't the people of God. I mean, granted, they weren't spiritual Israel. And there was a huge political difference between natural Israel that were genetically Jews and spiritual Israel, which believed in Yeshua HaMashiach, the Jewish Messiah who was going to come and save them from their sins. Huge difference. But in the middle of all of that, Israel as a nation received incredible blessings. I mean, you're walking through a desert for 40 years and you got central air. In the middle of the day, God's got a pillar of cloud over you so the sun doesn't burn you up. And in the nighttime, deserts are cold. So he sent up a pillar of fire, which is central heat, 20 miles out. And he fed them manna from heaven. Don't tell me God didn't love them and don't tell me God didn't bless them. The problem was they didn't receive it. They didn't think they were unthankful for what they got. Look around you. What do you got? I'm thankful for what we got. They say, yeah, but it's scary out there and there's a mess. God's got that. Now, I'm preaching to me. I told you when I started this sermon, I'm preaching to me first. So my shoes are all ready. They need a good polish after that sermon. Uh, 
but hang on to it. Grab some of that, okay? So Israel. Okay. Israel refused. This is Hebrews 3 and 4. You can read this. Israel refused to rest in God's promises. They knew his word, but they would not walk in his way. Wow. That is called disobedience, isn't it? If you know the word of God, I'm, we're talking now to us as church people. If you know the word of God, but you choose not to obey it, that's disobedience. Disobedience, God says, is like unbelief in God's eyes. If you really believed what I really said, then you'd obey cheerfully and with your hand out saying, God, thanks for what's coming. Thank you for what's coming. But disobedience equals unbelief in God's eyes. The warning here is that we don't want to be disobedient. We want to be thankful. We want to be restful. And I'm working on it just like you folks. You understand that? I'm not preaching down at you. We're, we're on level ground before the foot of the cross right here. Okay? We're on level ground. But resting equals a trust fall. What's it say? Resting equals trusting. Resting equals trusting and believing in what? In his love, in his goodness. He's a good God. Yes, I know that bad things happen to good people. I get that. Dr. Robert Schuler wrote a book about that. I understand that. Been through some rough times in my own life, you know. But I can tell you that coming through those rough times, God never left me. I can tell you that his blessing was at every turn. And every loss was covered over by huge gains. Did it take time? Sure. Life does. But we're here for the duration. So I'm resting in and believing in and trusting in the love and the goodness of God and his promises of deliverance. The word salvation in, in the Hebrew means deliverance. Deliverance from what? Judgment to come, yes, but deliverance from every evil thing that raises up against you. God is your deliverer. He's our deliverer. And trusting and believing in his promises of deliverance, you all say peace. Peace, sister. Peace. As you go, the peace of Christ be with you. Okay? Peace. Jesus is what the? Prince of Peace. Thank you. Okay. And blessing. Again, Jeremiah 29, 11, God said, I didn't come to hurt you. I came to bless you, to give you a great future. And if life is sometimes hard, that's life. But you know what? I will get you through it. And I will bring you out the other side with shouts of hallelujah. Because of who I am. That is God. Blessing. And, well, when I have a need, God will give me just enough. That's not what his word says. He'll somehow see to it that you squeak through. He'll get you through the day by the skin of your teeth. Really? That's not what it says. It says, I, Jesus said, I came to give you life, but I came to give it to you what? More abundantly. More abundantly than what? More abundantly than anybody else has got it. And I don't mean anybody else in the church. I mean anybody outside the kingdom. The abundance of God is yours. The wealth of the wicked is laid up for the righteous, the scripture says. All right, okay, well, so what is rest? And I think we're going to stop with this. Hang on here. Oh, uh, no, nope. we've got two. And then we're going to stop halfway through. <laughs> what is rest? A complete surrender. It's a tippy-toe on the cliff of life where you say, God, come get me because I trust you. I'm letting go, God. Is it scary? Yeah, but he'll never disappoint you. He'll never not catch you in your trust fall. All right? A complete surrender to the control of your life to his sweet sovereign will. 
not in a billion years would I have figured out that God would have taken me where he's taken me. I didn't think I had it in me, and I didn't know that there was enough in God that he could have helped me accomplish the things I got accomplished. Why? Because it was all him. It's all grace. It's all mercy. It's all God. And all I do is say, do it to me, Lord. (laughs) Walk me through this life successfully because I surrender to your sweet, sovereign will. That is the will of our loving. Y'all say loving with me? Our loving God. Our loving God. It is a full trust fall. Excuse me, it's a full trusting Okay, in God's love and his wisdom. You look at this mess around you, do you think God knows what he's doing? Oh, that was silent. I know, every now and then I feel the same way. (laughs) Do you think God knows what he's doing? The scripture says he never slumbers nor sleeps, so he didn't fall asleep at the switch. So what's all this mess? It's God working out his plan. And let me tell you, when you're at the end of that plan, you're going to like what you get. You're going to like what God accomplishes at the end. So I don't like what I'm going through right now, but it's making you tough. Any of you ever work out in a gym? Thank you. A few of you did. I remember going to the gym with, I don't know, did I not take you or, no? You were too little then. They wouldn't let you in. That's right. Took Jim and John and we'd go to Ballet Matrix. And uh, we played racquetball and did all kinds of other things, but we'd work out with the weights. Yeah, I know. Isn't that funny? (laughs) And I looked like this. It's because I stopped. (laughs) But for years we went to Ballet Matrix and we pumped iron. And you know what I learned with pumping iron? Or doing the rowing machine, or you know what I learned? Repetitions are what count. You got to do the same thing over and over and over and over and over again. That's what builds the muscle. Now you got to take a couple days off because that tears down the muscle, then you got to rebuild the muscle. And I understood all of that, but let me tell you something that's how you get strong, and that's how you get strong in faith. You keep doing the same thing over and over again by believing God and trusting Him and resting in Him. And yes, sometimes you'll do better than others. Some days I did more reps than others. Uh, But understand, even if some days are better than other days, if you keep doing what you've been doing, the blessing of God will fall on you. It is the blessing of God to those who obey him. All right, and I'll close with this. Not that. You say, well, I don't know. I don't get this rest thing. How do I get it? How hard do I have to work for this rest? Mm. What's it say? Jesus said, come to me, all you who are weary and are heavy laden, and I will charge you a lot of money. I'll make you go through a bunch of stuff. You're going to have to jump a lot of hoops. And you're going to have to do the right thing for years and years and years. And if you fall away, too bad. You know. What does it say? I will give you the gift of rest. You don't earn it. You don't work for it. You don't pay for it. You simply understand that if you don't feel restful, you go to Jesus and you say, Jesus, teach me to rest. And I do that daily. And some days are better than others. (laughs) Teach me to rest in you, God. Say, do I dare rest in God? He loves you. Come on. Now, he's not a doting grandfather who'll give you anything you want. He's smarter than that. He's wiser than that. He'll give you what's good for you. Yeah, sometimes it's a kick in the pants. Thank you. You want to preach? No. Might be good. Might be good. This guy knows some of the word, I'll tell you. Okay. I'm closing. I'm not coming in for a 
you know, <laughs> I, I'm coming in for a landing, not going into a holding pattern. Uh, Come to me, all you who are weary and heavily burdened, and I will give you rest. I'll give you the gift of my rest. You need rest? Ask Jesus. Jesus.